It is now my pleasure to introduce our guest speaker for this evening, Professor Kent Anderson, the Deputy Vice-Chancellor, Community and Engagement. Last year, the university established this new position to provide strategic <coughs> leadership in the university's relationships with its key stakeholders, including community groups, as well as graduates and various friends groups. While Professor Anderson's position covers a wide range of responsibilities, he now plays a key role in coordinating the relationship between the university and graduates and the other members of convocation. Professor Anderson has a diverse background. He spent his childhood in Alaska studying, before studying in Japan, the United <coughs> States and the United Kingdom, specialising in law, politics, economics and Asian studies. Before academia, Professor Anderson was in a commercial lawyer in Hawaii and an airline executive in marketing. He has been a visiting professor in a number of universities in Japan and most recently held the position of Pro Vice Chancellor International at the University of Adelaide and Professor of Law in the Adelaide Law School. Tonight, Professor Anderson will provide an overview of the rationale for refreshing the UWA brand and recent initiatives to create greater engagement with UWA students and graduates. Please welcome Professor Kent Anderson. Thank you very much, Warden. I greatly appreciate the welcome. I'm going to take just one minute to set up here because I'm actually going to put on a mic so it allows me to move around a little bit. You heard that, and you could probably hear in my accent. I have a little bit of north of Queensland accent. And reflective of that, um, I like to move around a little bit. I spent all day, actually, I spent two and a half hours today lecturing in the law school, and the law students seem to allow it, so um, I hope you will as well. And we've got slides. Okay. And while you're waiting, I'm happy to inform that the Eagles will be playing Hawthorne next week. It looks, it's only halftime, but uh, they're well ahead, and so the Crows, I think, are going home. Um, but with that, thank you, uh, Warden, for having me, and, and thank you, uh, convocation uh, members, the graduates, uh, for welcoming me here. I've been here now just over 11 months, and one of the wonderful things, as Warren said in my uh, introduction, I've moved around a lot in my life. I've lived in North America and the UK and Hawaii. I've been in Australia for 15 years. And one of the wonderful things about coming to Perth is it has exceeded all of my expectations. Perth, WA, and you, the community at UWA, has just been so welcoming. Um, it's really been an absolute delight and a privilege to, to come here amongst you. I also, I know this was already acknowledged at the outset, but I also want to acknowledge that we do meet on Wajak Buja, the land of the Noongar people, and, and pay my respects to their elders, past and present. What I'm going to do today is talk about um, the brand story. And in talking about the brand story, can you hear me? Is it still okay if I move away from the mic? Yep. Nope, you can't? I'm getting fines and no, so I'll, I'll project directly at you. Hopefully that is enough to hear. Uh, I feel a bit like an adoptive parent on this story, this brand story. And like an adoptive parent, I'm perhaps a little bit too proud um, to show that I'm really there. Because this story begins in 2013, so really a, a year and a half before I arrived. And it's the story about who we are as a, as a university, but how we represent ourselves. So what I'm going to do tonight is, first I'm gonna give a little bit of a context about where we were in 2013. And then I'm gonna talk a little bit about what a brand is and why it matters. And then I'm going to give you all of the nitty gritty details about the brand refresh. And then we'll stop and we'll take a moment and we'll say, well, how's it going so far? So that's basically the rough plan. So the first is the context. So where were we in, in 2013? Well, the, one of the important things to remember in the university context is 
from our perspective, the world really changes in 2012. And the vice chancellor alluded to this in his comments, but from a university perspective, up until 2012, we basically had an old communist system. We had a capped number of places, and we opened the shutters, and as soon as the, that number of students that we were given an allotment for got here, then the shutters went down, and basically that was it. it 2012, the system becomes uncapped, and all of a sudden it moves into a competitive environment. Therefore, we're not guaranteed to have an, a certain number of students, and indeed, a student that moves to a different university can actually be taking from the students we would otherwise receive. Also, there's the international aspect to this. We've always had an open and international um, perspective here at UWA, and many of you will remember, particularly Colombo Plan scholars who studied alongside of you, and they enhanced the education and made it uh, a wonderful and robust place. The world around international students, though, begins to change quite radically in about um, 2008, after the global financial crisis. So the global financial crisis happens, and then many other countries, particularly New Zealand, Canada, a little bit the United States and the UK, realized that this was a really good space to be operating from a financial perspective, and recruiting international students was, so it becomes much more competitive. So up until 2012, again, basically we had a pretty easy job as a university, from a marketing, a recruitment, from getting great students here. We just were here, we said come in, we got enough, and the game was over. But from 2012 forward, it's a different story. It's much more competitive, and we have to be much more um, out there in order to encourage the best to be here, because students are the heartblood of the university. And working with students, educating students, that's the primary reason that we're here. And so that gives us the context from that point so 2012, how did it look? You don't need to look at the numbers. The numbers don't matter. I'm going to show you the big trends. So anyone who didn't bring your spectacles, no worries. OK, but what this shows is in 2012 and 2013, basically you can see this yellow line's going up, right? And you can see this blue line slightly going down. This is a graph of all of the year 12 students in West Australia about where their first choice is to go to university. And that yellow line that's going up, that's Curtin University. And that blue line that's going down, that's UWA. Okay? Now, you might say, well, that's all students. And we're here, we're the best students. So we don't really worry too much about that riffraff, and this has all the riffraff in it. Okay, you might say that, but first thing I would say is this is reflective of the popularity contest, the beauty contest, if you will of the general community. And so this is reflective of the wider community and how they're going. So you kind of want to do well on this. Not only that, if you do focus on what we call our market, those students that we do attract from, which are those students that have an ATAR of 80 or more, we get similar trends, slightly different. In this case, the blue one, this is us, this is UWA, and you can see it goes down slightly, and this is Curtin, you can see it goes up slightly, okay? What this is saying is, up to 2012, we were getting roughly 60% of that market share. And it says 57%. Actually, there's a little bit of rounding error. But basically, in the four years between 2012 and 2015, we've lost 1% of market share a year. We've gone down 4% of the students, the best and the brightest, those students that we really, we really want to be here with us. During that same time, our friends down the road at Curtin have gone up 4%. Okay? So over those same four years, they've gone up one. So again, it's still great. It's still wonderful that we have 57% of the best and the brightest wanting to come to us. But wouldn't it be better if we had 100%? Wouldn't it be better if we had 58% or 60% or 62%? So those are just two pieces of the context. Let me put a third one up. This one's a little bit more confusing, and it will take me just a minute to explain it. It's something called the net promoter score. So those of you that are business people, and particularly marketing people, will know exactly, oh, I know what that is. But it's not a common term for other people, so let me quickly talk through it. 
The net promoter score is when you go out and you ask people, would you actively promote this, this thing, in our case, the institution of the university, to others? And then you rate that on a scale of 0 to 10. If you say, yeah, I definitely would, you're a 9 or a 10, that's a plus. That's a plus one point. But if you're like, oh, I don't know, yeah, maybe, 0 to 6, that's a minus. That's a minus one. And then if you're like, oh, you know, 7, 8, then that doesn't count. And you take all of your pluses, all of your 9s and 10s, and you take all of your so-so's, uh, your minuses, your 6 to zeros, and you add those together, and that gives you a number. And then really good companies, for example, someone like Apple will have a 75. That's probably the highest out there um, anywhere. But anyway, these are our numbers with two groups. And let me take you through those. The first one is prospective undergraduates. We asked prospective undergraduates what they thought of the university, whether a whole bunch of universities, and whether they would, they would promote us. And we get a 21. OK? And that's, in the marketing world, that's pretty good. That's, that's OK. That's, that's, yeah, that's all right. You know, we could do better. There's places that do better than that, lots of universities. But it's not bad. You know, on the other hand, poor old ECU down here, they're at minus 44. So we've got, we've got an advantage. And then Curtin is at 2. OK, so that's, that's pretty good. That's an OK story. Compared to other places, we could do better, but it's an OK story. Among prospective international students, we ask the same question, and we get a slightly different result. Again, we get the same 21, which, again, it's all right. But look over at University of Sydney at 42 and University of Melbourne at 38. OK, so the first indicator is overall popularity contest. Second indicator is our market of year 12 students in WA that we're looking for. And the third indicator is just going out and talking to people. And you'll remember the last, uh, the first ordinary meeting, I also put up there the same survey stuff, net promoter score with alumni. And we scored an 18, which is, again, pretty good. But in comparison, University of Queensland has a 28 among their graduates. So, Again, these are not horrible, worrying things. These are not awful, but they're pretty so-so. They're pretty mediocre. They're not Eagles or Dockers level. They're kind of, uh, yeah, not, probably below Adelaide Crows, but anyway. <laughs> OK, so that's part of the context. Last bit of the context I just want to uh, remind you is the, the story here tonight is about students. Students are the heart blood of why we're here. And having good students, and indeed the best students that we can, makes for an interesting intellectual campus. It makes for a vibrant campus. And it is in driver of the entire enterprise. And therefore, we also need to be conscious of, of that being an aspect of a driver. And one of the aspects is 64% of the university's total income comes from student-derived uh, revenue sources. Okay, so the real reason we're interested is because we want to teach the best and the brightest and we want to have the vibrant campus and we want to do all the things that Lizzie was talking about with the Guild, but they also, it also has a financial consequence. If we don't get the students in, then we have to lay people off. We have to not do sponsorship um, of things like the Perth International Arts Festival. So, it does have an income aspect as well. That's not the main reason, but, but it is important to remember that. OK, so that's the context in 2013. And I think good management would say, well, yeah, that's all right. But boy, we really need to up our game on that. And that's exactly what happened. And that's why we started this brand refresh journey. So what is a brand refresh? What's a brand? And again, I know some of you in the room are saying, yeah, 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 come on, I know all this. But let me take it through it just uh, piece by piece as we go through. So what a brand is, some people think it's a logo. It's not. Some think it, people think it's a little tagline. It's not. What a brand is, is when I say a word of a company or an institution or organization, it's the image that pops up in your head. It's the emotion that goes with that. It's the way that all, uh, all of that is encompassed. So the, the logo or the tagline are just representations of the overall feel and mood of it. So that's what a brand is. 
here's some brands that I'm sure you're all familiar with. So what do you think when you see this? So, I mean, just for me, I see the Audi rings and I think quality. I see the McDonald's and I think cheap and fast. Um, I see the Kodak, everyone recognize Kodak down here? And I think outdated, okay? The Coca-Cola bottle I put in the corner because that's an interesting story about brand. Many of you will know this story. Coca-Cola, when you put Coca-Cola and Pepsi and you ask people to drink both of them and choose which one they like, overwhelming favorite is Pepsi. If you put the Coca-Cola bottle and the Pepsi bottle, the Coca-Cola bottle's the only trademarked bottle out there. If you put the Coca-Cola bottle and the Pepsi bottle and you ask one which, which one they like, 65% will say Coca-Cola. That's the power of brand. And it's because of all of the emotion that goes around it. I don't know about you, but for me, Coke was what I, went, what I drank when I went to the footy with my dad. And so it has all of this powerful emotion around it, as well as the taste. And that's what we're talking about brand. So it's not a logo. It's not a tagline. It's when I say UWA, what does that mean in your head? But even more importantly, what does that mean in the head of a 17 to 24 year old? Because remember those graphs we were just looking at? 17 to 24 year olds are really important to this university because they make up the heart of this university and because they're going to be critical to our future success. Here's a little bit of evolution of our logo, but the represent, or our brand, but the representation of that through the logo. And it starts off in 1928 and it goes through to 1972. And Joan, I saw her somewhere, where is Joan? Joan put up, Joan's in the back. Joan will help me with this because I'm sure I'm gonna get a mistake, but she'll send me an email um, afterwards <laughs> as she always does. But this is how our logo has, has evolved. And I have to say, there's, there's a couple of interesting things on this one. Actually, my favorite thing is right here. And I'm sure no one can see that. But this is the 1966 Walker designed. And there's two hake up on the top of it. See the hake crossed up there? You can just barely, oops. Just barely see them right there. So the story I heard, and actually I'll give this to Joan as a research project. She can confirm the story. But the story I heard was in 1966, they were putting this together. And so, you know, um, we're a long way from Hackett Winthrop being around in 1966. He's not there. But someone said, well, let's do something to represent him. I know Hackett, Hake, Hackett, Hake. Yeah, they kind of sound alike. And Hake are from Scotland. And, and Hackett, that's a Scottish name. Yeah, yeah, so we'll put some fish on there. Now, Joan's going to get me a little bit later asking about swan's legs, but I think you should ask anyone about fish. That was really controversial in my book. The other one I'd like you, it's hard to see here, is we've got a swan on top of um, uh, some armor. I don't know what the jousting swan's doing up there, but in 1928, they thought that looked pretty cool. Okay, but you can see how this has evolved around, and indeed, the one we're, we're most familiar with is the 1972. So many people would say, if you're waiting until 2014, that's actually quite a long time between polishing of the brand or, or the representation of it. Okay, so we set off on the, um, the brand journey, the journey to, to refresh the brand. And we're a university. You are graduates of a great university. And research is at the DNA of a great university. So when we set off on this, it wasn't like, oh, Kent, go get a pen and draw something up. It was research-led, just as you would expect. And that's an important part of how we went, how the university went about this. And there's really two stages. Whoops, see if I can go back. So the first stage, which begins in November 2013 and goes through until May 2014, went out and asked lots of people, what do you think of the university? How does it make you feel? What is your emotion? When I say those words, UWA, what's the image that pops in your head? And that's the first half, and slowly that's tweaked down to get a pretty concrete image of what it currently is and beginning the image of what it might be. And that was done with over 50 um, interviews of school leaders and students, uh, other people internal to the university. 
It was done with surveys of 400 current students, 80 prospective students. It was done through four workshops. It was done through 10 case studies. That's looking at 10 other universities who've been through this journey and how it went with them. And so that included Stanford University, it included University of Sydney, it included University of Melbourne. Uh, locally, it included Curtin University. But that's the first phase. And it's trying to get a good sense of the way it looks but also the way it might look, what the brand might be. Then the second phase was, well, now that we've done that, let's start testing some very concrete, some very crystal ideas. And that was run from June 2014 to January 2015, and it was testing those ideas that, well, so we've heard a whole bunch of people, but let's test and see if that really works, or if that's really true. And again, here we had 61 in-depth interviews with school and business leaders, prospective students and current students. We had 13 focus groups of obviously prospective students, international students, current students, postgraduate students, and convocation council. And so each focus group you know, has anywhere between seven and 20, depending on the focus group number of people. So in total, in this process, over 1,000 people were asked to contribute to this. So if you were one of those 1,000 people, thank you. Sincerely, thank you. If you weren't one of those 1,000 people, I'm sorry. <laughs> There's 100,000 graduates, um, and so we have to go through this process of, of what you can do to get it through. So what that told us, actually, is represented in this. And I don't know if you're familiar with this, but this is um, a pretty common technology now. You do all of that work. You pump all of that information into a, a computer software program, and then it picks up the consistent words. And, or that with that, and the bigger the word, the more often that comes up. Has everyone got kind of the concept of, what, of what's going there? So you can see the biggest one, people said, is beautiful. And that's wonderful. That's, the next biggest one is excellent. And that's wonderful as well. But then we've got some other ones. Old, boring, conservative, pretentious. I don't know about you. But I want to be beautiful, excellent. I even want to be old, but I don't know if I want to be boring, conservative, and pretentious. Something we're doing, we're not quite getting off. Because when I walk among you, as we'll do in drinks if I ever get off the stage, I don't see old, boring, conservative. I see actually excellent, beautiful, elite, fantastic people. So somewhere, the message is, is not working. And that's why we have a refresh. And that gets us up to, really, the 6th of February. And you will have, now at this stage, you will have all seen this, the refresh of the logo, and the other one. Let me just spend a moment on this. I'm sure you have all seen this. I'm sure you have your own opinions on it. Um, but let me focus on this one, because it's actually quite um, for the, this university, it's actually quite um, radical. You know what it doesn't say? It doesn't say university. It says UWA. When we went out and we asked graduates what they call the university, 80% say, well, I call it UWA. There's a small bit that say, I call it UW. There's a small bit, most of them don't live in Australia any longer, who say, I call it the University of Western Australia. But you, the people in this room, and most other people say, oh, I call it UWA. And so we thought, let's use that. But you know what we also thought is, we live in the best city in the entire world. And you've just heard my bio. You know I've lived in pretty much every other city in the world, so I can say that. Okay? And we had never told anyone that. So Crawley, I live in Crawley. My, my postal code is in Crawley. But I have to say, if I meet anyone, I live in Perth. And when you're traveling, when you go to Adelaide, or when you go to Sydney, or when you go to Dubai, or when you go to London, do you say, oh, I live in Shenton Park? <laughs> or do you say, I come from Perth? So we slapped it right there. And that's also important because that's telling the world, we are here. We're major, we're serious, we're, and we take pride in that. So two little tweaks on that. And I know you, you well, we'll come back to these in a minute. But first. Uh, whoops, okay, yeah, well, sorry, I've changed the, the order of these. Um, and we launched this internally to the staff and to Convocation Council on the 5th of May. And then on the 6th of May, 
um, we went uh, public with it. So on the 5th of May in Winthrop Hall, here's a photo of it. We had the launch uh, for staff and convocation council. And at the same time outside, Lizzie and I, where's Lizzie? Lizzie and I were outside on Riley Oval launching it with students. And then on the 6th of May, the next day, we, we uh, shared it with the greater world. It was actually a little bit cloak and dagger because you don't want to share it with the rest of the world until um, you shared it internal. And so a fun time. So that's the internal launch. Um, but the really piece de resistance was the commercial. Let me tell you a little bit about the commercial. I know you've seen it, but let me tell you a little bit before I show it. So the first thing you'll hear is the, sorry, I can't do it, Alec, <laughs> the drumming. And the drumming is our uh, School of Music precision or, uh, percussion team. So it's four uh, percussionists led by one of the most amazing lecturers over there. So you'll listen to it, original score scripted by them, played by them. Then you'll see the, the, the places, and we go through a number of places in this. And, but this, of course, starts off in the iconic Winthrop Hall, but then it goes into the sand dunes of Western Australia. But then it also leaps to see the world. And one of the things we learned from all of that research is, particularly the prospective students, wanted to see how UWA linked to Paris, how UWA linked to New York, and et cetera. And so we, we show that. We've got our actress here, too. Born and bred UWA. Uh, not UWA, uh, excuse me. Born and bred uh, Western Australia. Okay? Comes from mixed heritage, as do I, as do many of us. Um, she is pursuing her impossible. We'll come back to the slogan in a minute, but you know it's pursue impossible. She wants to go to the Olympics. Right now, she's the best long jumper in WA. She wants to go to the Olympics for Australia. She needs to get to that next stage. So that's part of her story, which links into part of our story, which is pursuing each individual's impossible. I want to come back to that, but let's watch the commercial or first, if I know how to do it. Nope, sorry. And we don't have sound. So that's the commercial. Hopefully you've seen it on television. Hopefully you've heard it on the radio. Hopefully you've seen it at the, the cinema. What it captures is the key point. And so if you can take away one message from tonight, it's this next point. What we learned and what this is trying to do is up until now, a lot of our brand had been telling the world how great we were. World's top 100 university, Nobel prizes, prime ministers, and that's wonderful, but how the world heard it was, that's you talking about yourself. What does it have to do with me? The key point of the new brand is it flips that. And it says, what is your impossible? What is it that you want to achieve? Particularly remember, the main audience here is 17 to 24 year olds. For some of them, it will be going to university, first in family. For some of them, they will draw inspiration from seeing prime ministers and Nobel laureates. That's what they achieve for. But for each one of them, it will be a different story. And what the brand refresh is about, the key thing about it is flipping that message. Stop talking about us. Start talking about 
the students and how we can help them achieve that impossibility. That's the key point. Okay, and then you've seen it played out in a number of ways. So we have the buses, um, outdoor advertising. One of the interesting things, we've added a whole bunch of uh, merchandise. This is going to ramp up now, but you can, if you haven't already, uh, buy your merchandise online. Um, and then one of the culminations of it, of course, was the brand at Open Day. And Open Day was an amazing success this year. We had more people than we've ever had to an Open Day before. Over 20,000 people showed up. Um, and you can see the way the brand was represented there. An incredible vibe. One of the, well, we'll come back to it in a second. Um, but a great opportunity. But let me personally thank all of the uh, Convocation graduates who participated, because we had a whole group of Convocation members, of graduates, who were there giving advice to the students coming in. Oh, this is how I worked it in my career. And I, is Jonathan here? He's probably watching that Hawthorne match. <laughs> uh, but he, I was talking to him about him giving advice in the, in the big tents to incoming uh, architecture students. But a wonderful, wonderful day. All right, you heard in my bio, I'm a lawyer, professor of law. So I'm going to actually do something. I'm going to address your criticisms first, hopefully to head them off at the pass. But we'll, we'll give it a shot, give you a bit of a retort. So there's two strains of criticisms that have, or critiques that have come across. And the first one is this. Why do anything? Why now? But I don't like it. OK, so let me reply to each of those in, in turn. So the first one, why do anything? I like it, you know, I like it as it is. This is what I was doing back in those first slides on context to show you if we just kept doing what we were doing, how the trend lines were going, okay? So I actually think to do nothing was, was, the, was the problem. I think you had to do something. Um, so that's one of the points. But I also think it's important with this is you, th for me at least, when I see the final outcome, it does respect the tradition. It is obviously linked to that evolution and the five other ways that it has come out. So it respects that tradition, but it then moves into that space of going forward. So that's one. Another one is, why now? Oh, we all know it's budgetary hard times in the university. Paul mentioned that, but everyone mentioned it. Why now? It costs so much. It, doesn't it cost money? It does cost money to do that. But why now? You can't you do this later. My argument is, because it's financially difficult, is now, now is the time to do it. Otherwise, you can get in a downward spiral, 64% of our income coming from students, if we just allow that to dwindle away, that's, I think, more public than anything else. The last one is, oh yeah, but I don't like it. I guess I've got two responses to that. One is, I'm an old, middle-aged white guy. To be honest, it doesn't matter if I like it that much or not. I'm not 17 to 24 getting ready to make a choice about where I'm going to study. That's one response. Another one is, yeah, I as an individual might like it, but it's actually backed by quite a bit of research. As I said, over 1,000 people um, surveyed. We had our marketing professors from the business school involved. We had student interns involved. Um, and we have to play a little bit of averages. As a big university, as a big institution, some things we'll like and some things we won't like. But I'm betting on the research that, puts, uh, that makes this as the outcome. Um, so that's the first strain that you get. The second strain you get is a bit pedantic. Um, and I'm a pendant, so I can say that. Um, and the first one is legs. And, and Joan, you've snuck out. Oh, you're still here. You're just bending over. So Joan and I have had a long conversation on the legs, and I don't know if you can see it, but, but the swan doesn't have uh, legs. I'll, I'll actually tell you, for me, the reason why I actually love the new swan. Because for me, it represents it's on water. And my first day in Perth was actually not going to the vice chancellor's office. My first day in Perth was going with Richard Wally the Wajak elder, the Nunga elder, and it was down to the river, to Matilda Bay. And one of the things Richard told me that really sticks, stuck with me is for the Nunga people, the water is what links all of us. It's the thing that flows throughout the world. And in Nunga culture, this is what connects people. 
So the fact that our symbol is on water, for me, is incredibly powerful. And the second thing is, it is on, for me, it is on water, but you'll see the wings are up. And the wings are up, for me, represents we are trying to put the wind beneath those wings of those students. This is about the taking off. And if we get to it, um, I've got a wonderful photo that I can show you of a, every morning I run along Matilda Bay and I have the image in my head because I see it every time I scare those, swan, or those swans about them taking off. And that goes back to the entire purpose of what we're trying to do here. The second critique is around the Latin. And I don't even, I am so impressed by the people that pick this up because it is so hard, but nevertheless, I'll take it. You remember we had the five different shields uh, up there? The first one actually had no words on it. The original books had no words. The second version had a squiggly line to represent writing. The third version had Greek. The fourth version had Latin. But it wasn't like someone went out and found Latin. It's some guy made it up. So whoever in 19, oh, I think that one was 1966 or 62 or something around that, and they just pulled out their Latin dictionary, strung together some words, and, and put together the, the slogan. So it wasn't based on anything. So when we actually went back and had the opportunity to go look at this, we went to Virgil. And I have to say, Virgil for me is much more important um, than going to my Latin dictionary in 1966 to string together a few words. And we took words from uh, uh, Virgil's, I always, sorry, I never took Latin. My son is a big fan, but I never took it. Aenid, book six. And the Latin now reads, all who improve life through discoveries in arts and science. And we thought that hearkened back to the Sikh wisdom that we know and we're so familiar with. Um, and again, remember how I said, you know, it's not so much me as a middle-aged white guy getting to choose it. My actual choice was I was going to put Nunga on there or maybe some Chinese characters. But we settled for Latin and it was Virgil. I guess that's okay. Um, and then the third one is, of course, the grammar points. And everyone in this room, I hope everyone in this room took grammar. Actually, I, I'm happy to confess my age, but I was right at the cusp of where grammar quit being taught. Um, so, and I am, from the university uh, staff demographic, I'm the perfect median. Half of the staff is younger than me and half the staff is older than me. Anyone on the younger half has not taken grammar. Nonetheless, I was a journal editor for about 15 years. And so I am an enormous grammar pendant. And it is grammatically incorrect, pursue impossible. You need a the, you need an a, you need something to normalize it, it there. Um, Completely recognize and acknowledge that. Um, as, my students will, as my students will tell you, I can uh, debate a split infinitive, a dangling participle uh, with the best. And indeed, I'm actually, ha after having this conversation, very keen to have the grammar be. I'm pretty sure Channel 7 will pick it up. Um, and we can debate the Oxford comma, because I am a big fan of the Oxford comma, though we seem to uh, have thrown it out. But the core point, there's two core points on the grammar. The first is, from that test, from the student perspective, it doesn't upset them as much as it upsets many of the others. Um, and I was actually reading, everyone takes the, the Saturday West, right? And what is his name? Zoltan uh, Kavik. Um, and you know, I love that article. And, but he, last week's column was quite good because he was talking about having the confidence to break grammar rules is actually a true sign of, of knowing what you're doing. And, and so we do break a grammar rule. So my first point is, um, so maybe the, the target audience is all right. My second point, though, is actually when you first heard that and you thought, that's not right. What is it? And it caused you that fraction of a moment to pause. From a marketer's perspective, that is gold because they've pulled you into the conversation. It no longer is just you know, washing off you. For that second, that just brief microsecond, they've got you. And now you're saying, well, why is it impossible? Oh, oh, well, that's kind of weird. So it, it actually, it works um, from, from that level. Um, 
But indeed, my, my grammar teacher and I remember we used to have to structure sentences. She would be appalled, and I understand that. Um, I'm almost done. So that was launched in the beginning of May. You've seen the commercials. You've seen it in the newspapers. You've seen it in the Australian. Uh, you've seen it in the Qantas in-flight magazine. Is it having impact? Well, it's early, early days. On a lot of this brand and marketing, we're actually looking at a two-year, 18-month to three-year window. So after not even six months, it's, it's really early days. But let me tell you what we do know so far. One is the online. So the online world gives us a lot quicker feedback than, we, than we're used to. And here we've got, on the Pursue Impossible website, we've had uh, 30,000 hits. On the YouTube, uh, watching the commercial, we've had 74,000 views. On Facebook, we've had 55,000 views, 600 plus shares, and 1,000 uh, plus likes. Those numbers for the university are the best we've ever done. So Tim Minchin, and actually the, the chancellor's um, cameo in the Tim Minchin video, top this, but anything other than Tim Minchin, these, these are record setting for the university. So that seems, we're pretty happy with that. The second one is Open Day. And again, Open Day, 20,000 plus. Um, we actually had um, a, a company walking around taking surveys of people there. And 99% of the people, anytime as a social scientist, anytime I get to 99%, I get a little bit worried. But 99% of the people say, this is great. This is better than I expected. So we're getting really good results from that. And then the third one is enrollments. I also apologize for the, um, the spelling pendants. You'll know this is the correct spelling in North America. Yes, and I know, I know, I have to go back actually to my year uh, five teacher who taught me that grammar. She also taught me how to spell. I, I also spell program with one M at the end. Um, but our enrollments in second semester uh, were the largest in the university history. It really is a, is a long bow to say what we did in between May and the end of July had, had impact. Nevertheless, it's a really good sign, and those are the early signs that we have. So in conclusion, it was a refresh that needed to happen because of the context of where we are. It was one that was based on research. But most importantly, the message of it is that it flips the message to being about students and what they can achieve and how we can help them achieve that. And that is the critical message. The call to action here is for you, members of convocation, graduates. One of UWA's greatest strengths, indeed, the warden in his uh, speech uh, said, inherent strength of the university is the tradition and the relationship with its graduates. Remember those trend lines, and remember Curtin, and remember UWA, we've got an advantage on them, and it's you. People who care about this place and people who are willing to stand up for this place. So we as, tall, we as people familiar with tall poppies, we're always a little bit scared to, to stand up. But I'm asking you to do something for your university, and that's be proud and stand up because we need your help in this post-2012 world where we want to attract the best and the brightest so that we can continue the tradition that you're a part of. Thank you very much.